Hello, this is Mark Peacock, and welcome to the Travel Commons Podcast. This is Travel Commons Podcast number 74, recorded Thursday, May 14th, 2009. This is the podcast giving the voice of the traveler. It's more about the journey than the destination. Today's podcast is the fourth anniversary edition, the best of four years of Travel Commons. This week coming to you today from the Seattle Marriott waterfront just down the street from historic Pike's Place Market. On the uh, Just right on the waterfront, uh, see a couple of cruise ships pass by and, uh, and some bikers on a trail. It's a, uh, it was rainy when I got in this morning, uh, nothing, uh, nothing too out of the ordinary for the Pacific Northwest, but by about uh, 3 o'clock this afternoon, all the clouds blew off, uh, the, sun, uh, the sun came out. It's a beautiful, beautiful day here in, uh, in Seattle. And it was four years ago today today that I recorded the first Travel Commons podcast in the bathroom of the Wardman Park Marriott in northwest Washington, D.C. This is the first Travel Commons podcast, so uh, bear with us. We've got kind of a lousy microphone, and we're going to be trying some new stuff along the way, but I hope you enjoy, uh, I hope you enjoy what we've got to say. Why, why should you care? Why should you listen? Why should you even think about subscribing to this podcast? Well, if you're interested in travel, uh, that's what we're going to talk about, and uh, really sort of the ground-level experiences of a, uh, of a traveler, someone, someone who's uh, in airplanes and hotels and rental cars every week. That's me. And I have to say, I've surprised myself by continuing to record for four years and from a whole lot of places. From the uh, bathroom of the uh, Wardman Park Marriott. Coming to you from the bathroom of the Camelback Inn. From the bathroom of the uh, LAX Weston. The Mystic Marriott Hotel and Spa in lovely scenic Groton, Connecticut. No hotel bathroom for this podcast. I've been in town all week. From the bathroom of the Residence Inn on Tudor Wharf in Charlestown. From the bathroom, or is it the WC or the Toilette? Uh, of the Novotel in downtown Geneva, Switzerland, Budapest, Hungary. From the mobile studio in uh, in suburban Chicago, uh, actually the uh, the '95 Chevy Blazer that uh, that's my airport car. Bathroom of the Orchard Hotel in San Francisco. Bathroom of the Marriott Courtyard in Oldsmar, Florida. The Civic Center Marriott in Durham, North Carolina. In the bathroom of the Stamford, Connecticut Marriott. From the Marriott Courtyard in East Memphis. Doubletree Club in Santa Ana, California. From the Marriott in Memphis, Tennessee. From the bathroom of the Oldsmar, Florida Courtyard. Bathroom of the uh, Philadelphia Marriott. Coming to you from the bathroom of the Bellagio Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Supposed to be coming to you from the bathroom of the Embassy Suites in Philadelphia, the Marriott Courtyard in Irvine, California, from the quite nice Laguna Hills Marriott in Dana Point, California, the Orlando, Florida Downtown Marriott, the uh, San Mateo, California Marriott, from the Huntington Beach Hilton Resort, from the Newport Beach Marriott, the San Francisco Airport Marriott Courtyard in Northwest Houston, Renaissance Madison Hotel in Downtown Seattle, Rancho Las Palmas Resort and Spa. Marriott Courtyard in San Francisco's Soma District. Marriott Courtyard in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Gaithersburg, Maryland Marriott. From the Newark Liberty Airport Marriott. Right smack dab in the middle of some witch's brew of access roads in the center of Newark Airport. The Brooklyn Marriott. By popular demand from the business class toilet, or loo, of a South Africa Airlines Airbus A340 somewhere between New York and Johannesburg, South Africa. You know, listening to that, you'd think that Marriott would give me lifetime platinum status just for combat duty. And I'll tell you, traveling regularly, constantly, over the past four years, it has at times, many times, felt, well, less than exhilarating. Was any one thing about this Friday flight so earth-shatteringly bad? No, not really. It was just a piling on of one inconvenience after another. The best quote I read was in Friday's USA Today. An an older couple who travel, I guess, extensively in their retirement described the travel experience now as tedious. That is the perfect adjective. And while for the leisure traveler, you can get over tedious with a day on the beach, for the frequent traveler, and I have four plane trips planned this week, up and back to both Houston and San Francisco, there's no time to get over tedious. It just wears on you. 
And probably the one key thing that has made travel the most tedious over the past four years has been the USTSA. We thought we had it bad with the shoe carnival. One guy tries to light a shoe on fire four, uh, four or five years ago, and now millions of people are, tra- are, are traipsing through airports in their bare feet. But then it just got silly. The ongoing crackdown by the TSA and its UK counterparts on, uh, on carry-on liquids really remains the biggest issue for the frequent traveler. And, and if you peel back what's going on and what's really getting on people's nerves, it's having to check luggage or toss your toiletries. It's a trade-off between losing time and losing looks. I mean, what's the value of an extra hour, of the extra hour it takes to check and retrieve your luggage? I mean, for the leisure traveler who's taking a round trip, what, once every six weeks, once every six months, it's no big deal. For the frequent traveler, though, with two, maybe three round trips a week, that equation solves very differently. Now, for guys, the impact is really more annoying than anything. As I described in my blog entries on the Travel Commons site, I retooled my toiletry kit that first weekend to meet the TSA guidelines. I replaced toothpaste with tooth powder, gel antiperspirant with dry deodorant, and hair gel with hair wax. That last swap didn't quite pass the TSA muster, though. On my first trip with a new kit, an O'Hare TSA screener pulled my bag off their conveyor and asked to look inside. Aha, he exclaimed, raising my new jar of Jason's stuck-up hair styling wax to eye level. I don't know, just that label probably got his attention. Hair gels are not allowed, he said, unscrewing the cap. It's not a gel, I said. It's a wax. No gels are allowed. Only solids, he continued. Okay, look, a wax isn't a gel. It's a solid. I mean, you know, if you look at the definition, it's a solid mass of hydrocarbon polymers, while a gel is sort of a looser matrix of polymers in which a liquid like a water is entrained. He just looked at me. This is a solid, he said, wrapping his knuckles on the metal table. You know, it was at this point, really, that the silliness of the exchange really hit home. Not, not to be elitist about it, but, but here I am, a chemical engineer with all sorts of material science, thermodynamics, physics educations, debating the definition of a solid with a guy that, you know, I'll tell you from the look at it, maxed out his higher education somewhere around 10th grade. You know, this is not an argument I was going to win, and my guess was the further I pushed it probably meant that losing was going to pretty quickly get more painful. Going through a TSA screening checkpoint at 5 a.m. is never a good time, let alone a 5 a.m. encounter with an overzealous screener. Monday morning in O'Hare, a TSA screener pulls out my bag from the x-ray machine, asks me to open it up. Not, you know, no problem, I say. I'm... I just tried to survive long enough to make it to the Starbucks stand for a caffeine infusion. She makes a beeline to my toiletry bag, which I'd packed on top of my clothes just so the TSA wouldn't have to go rummaging through everything. She opens up my toiletries, grabs the bottle of Echodent tooth powder, and without looking at it, holds it up and loudly says, You can't take this on! I wait for a moment, let her bask in her triumphant find, and then ask her, Why not? It's tooth powder! You guys announce a no solids rule overnight? She turned the bottle around, finally looked at the label, and put it back. No apologies, no whoops, no my bad. Typical. At O'Hare, the guy put my tooth powder aside, repacked everything, and then said, you know, kind of apologetically, sorry, you can't take this on. Why not, I asked. It's tooth powder. The guy picked it up again, read it, read the label this time, and looked at me with a surprised smile. Wow, I... I, I'd never heard of that before, and then started quizzing me about how I use it and how it tastes. And in Boston, as the guy was repacking my kit, he said, well, here you go. Next time, pull out all the liquids, pointing, and he was pointing to the tooth, uh, tooth powder bottle. It's tooth powder, I said again. He looked at the label. He said, wow, sorry about that. I've been up since 4 a.m. Though it's not just the U.S. airport security that's gotten tougher. The most interesting screening experience, though, was at Schiphol. I, I, you know, I don't think I set off the metal detector, but I was waved over for a secondary search, a full body pat down. Now, I get these sometimes in the U.S. too, and it, it's really not that much of a bother. And I, and I don't have an argument with the case for doing random secondaries. I really don't. I, I, I can understand it. So, you know, pulled over uh, here in uh, Schiphol, I, I, I just assumed the usual position. 
arms out, legs slightly spread, and was ready for the pad down. What I wasn't ready for was the intensity of the physical contact. In the U.S., it's, you know, a quick light brush over the arms, legs, and torso. In Skipple, the guy, like, clamped down on my wrist and ankles and actually was putting some pretty serious wrinkles in my slacks. A little disconcerting, but, you know, not too much of a problem. What got my attention, though, was when he moved from my left leg to my right, transiting the region between these two appendages. He took just as firm a hand in patting down my, how do I say this without getting an explicit tag in iTunes, patting down my manhood. I mean, you know, I don't get that sort of attention even in San Francisco. And though I've played a lot of music in this podcast over the past four years, no song has been more popular with you, the listeners, than this one. All my bags are packed. I have my ID, a printed itinerary, a boarding pass, and major credit card. And I'll show you that my computer works I'll shake my head at all the jerks Whose crankiness is making this so hard So frisk me to check for clues Tell me to take off my shoes Touch me, ask me what you need to know I'm leaving on a jet plane Just stand in line and don't complain And soon they'll let me go It's embarrassing each time I hear Detectors beep on my brassiere It's underwire, so watch your hands, you punk There's no hurry now, my flight's delayed It's all because somebody made A joke and ass, so is our pilot drunk? So frisk me to check for clues Tell me to take off my shoes Touch me, ask me what you need to know I'm leaving on a jet plane Just stand in line and don't complain And soon we'll get to go I tell you, I love that song. I uh, I drew a couple of glances when I started laughing out loud while editing it. Of course, I couldn't hear myself laugh because I had on my Bose noise-canceling headphones, the official headphones of the Travel Commons podcast, and that's not just me. You know, there's a bit of a cult in the uh, in the airplane cabin around Bose. Looking around the uh, looking around the first class cabin, and I had scored a rare first class upgrade on my uh, on my way out Tuesday. In the first class cabin, at least a third of the passengers were wearing Bose cans. Indeed, it's not that rare to see guys wearing their Bose into the toilet. Now, I was behind one Bose wearing guy in the toilet line a few weeks back. And after he went in and locked the door, I looked at the flight attendants and said, you know, you may want to step back. I'm not sure if he wore those noise-canceling headphones in there for a reason. They looked at me for a moment and then just broke up laughing, which started again when the guy walked out of the toilet. <laughs> he, looked, he looked a little confused. And then when the uh, United flight attendant uh, wheeled the cart down the aisle this morning on my uh, flight from O'Hare to Seattle uh, peddling snack boxes for six bucks, I remembered this bit from Travel Commons podcast number 59. And for those of you ripping open the cellophane on your $2 muffin you bought on your flight to Grandma's, Northwestern University Library has just launched web access to their Transportation Library menu collection, which they say includes more than 400 menus from 54 national and international carriers, cruise ships, and railroad companies with coverage from 1929 to the present. 
Each page of each menu has been scanned. The lunch menu for a March 1969 United flight from San Francisco to Detroit supports United's red carpet theme with a bright red accent on each page. The beverage list asks passengers to please be our guest and order the United special very dry martini, gin or vodka. On the facing page, we can see Foster commenting that the poached quenelle of scallops Nantua sauce was excellent. He didn't know whether he chose the broiled filet mignon bursi sauce or baked Lagostino's Thermidor for his entree. bit different from the turkey wrap and the cold chicken salad I was offered when upgraded to uh, United's First Class a couple of weeks ago. I did get a bit of a chuckle out of the 1962 menu for East Africa Airways. No food, just booze and cigarettes. I tell you, those, those had to be happening flights. But you can't get too wound up with the hassles of travel. I don't know if it's Zen, with Zen's emphasis on mindful acceptance of the present moment, or jujitsu with its training on using your attacker's energy against him, that sort of bend like a willow, don't break like an oak thinking. But keeping sane in today's business travel is all about finding ways to flow around the obstacles rather than breaking yourself upon them. This, of course, is completely antithetical to the concept of a road warrior, one who controls every aspect of their travel experience, from booking the right fare code to get a free first-class upgrade. You know, but these days, control over your travel plans is a very tenuous thing. A couple of weeks ago, I was settling into my business class seat on United's flight from Chicago to Amsterdam. The plane was full, but not jammed, when I felt and heard a bang. This is not a good thing. We hadn't left the gate yet, so I wasn't too worried. You know, I don't know, perhaps somebody was a bit rough in hooking up the tug or closing a luggage door. However, when I heard the captain key the mic... I started to worry. He called down to the ground crew and asked them, what in the heck were they doing? Now, only then, only then did they tell him that one of the baggage loaders had decided to take a shortcut with his luggage cart and drive under the plane. Unfortunately, he was a poor judge of height and didn't quite make it, hence the bang. The luggage cart hit the fuselage of the 767 hard. The captain called out maintenance, who didn't take long to figure out that the resulting ding in the aluminum skin wasn't going to stand up to a North Atlantic crossing. We packed up our belongings and shuffled back into O'Hare. All the flight attendants were just shaking their heads. None of them had ever heard of anything like this before. Now, I was traveling with a 24-year-old colleague. Now, he was an experienced leisure traveler, but was new to international business travel. We left the plane with no known departure time, no idea how we were going to get from Chicago to Amsterdam. What do we do now, he asked, his pupils dilating just a bit. Do we stay? Do we go home? Do we head over to the international terminal? Nope. We go grab a sandwich and a beer and give United an hour to figure this thing out. Travel tip, beer makes this Zen thing a whole lot easier. Because... There are always a lot of interesting sights along the way. Former colleague of mine, um, and when he was a regular on the Northwest Red Eye between San Francisco and Detroit, he bungee corded his head to the airplane seat back to prevent his head from doing that sort of forward head bob. Um, actually, he had gone to the point after the first couple of times and he was noticing a crease across his forehead, he actually started carrying a bandana that he would then put on his forehead and then stretch the bungee cords uh, across his head. We're in the, uh, the waiting area, and the plane's out there, and they, they said, well, it's going to be delayed for about a half an hour. The flight was coming in from someplace like Chicago or something, and it got, got, they told us it got struck by lightning on the way in. That's all they told us at the time. And so we're just sitting around, and we noticed that out comes this mechanic guy with, you know, an extension ladder it's like 10 feet outside the window this is the nose of the plane and he comes right over to the nose and he puts the extension ladder up against the plane and he climbs up he's got a roll of duct tape dangling from his belt and 
you know, at this time, a small a small crowd has gathered at the window, and they're looking at the guy because this is the plane we're going to be flying to Paris in. It's like, what is he doing out there? You know, he's kind of like monkeying around with like, you know, it looked like he was scraping paint off or something. And he takes the roll of duct tape off his belt, and he rips off like a six inch piece. And he just slaps it on the on the plane, on the nose of the plane, <laughs> and he's rubbing it, and make sure that it's you know it's okay. And then he kind of looks over. And he notices like 30 people staring at him with kind of like the shocked expression on their faces. Like, what's going on out there? And he's nodding his head kind of like, you know, we can't hear him through the glass, but he's kind of like saying, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. So he climbs down the ladder and like two minutes later he shows up on the, uh, the jetway. He's knocking on the door and the, uh, the attendant lets him back into the waiting area at the gate, the gate area. And uh, he, he says, folks... I just want to tell you, the plane was struck by lightning, and um, the lightning found a defect in one of the rivets, and that's where it exited. It found a rivet, and it kind of blew it out, and they had to locate it, and they did locate it, and he's like, it's not duct tape, it's, it's a Teflon tape, and it's only temporary, the, the plane's fine. <laughs> so he put us all at ease with his explanation, but it was pretty, pretty interesting to observe when it was happening. So walking down the uh, down the concourse, I, I saw a bunch of people standing back from the gate looking around. That's never a good sign, and I was already in a cranky mood. You know, what what is this? A broken plane, a missing crew, a jammed jetway? Well, to my surprise, it was none of the above. Instead, it looked like an episode of fame had broken out. There's a bunch of teenagers doing a dance routine in front of the gate agent's desk, complete with musical accompaniments from somebody's Bose boombox. You know, even the most jaded frequent traveler had to stop and watch. Now, I know the gang at Hertz and Avis are just going to cringe if they end up here in this segment, but the phrase, it's just a rental, is a common refrain, usually sung right before you do something that you wouldn't do to your own car. It's always fun watching a group like that sort of moving into shots. And it's shots, plural, because kind of like Lay's potato chips, nobody can do just one. And as the night gets longer, the mental age seems to degrade. People regress from seasoned professionals to young professionals to college to high school, which is sort of usually where it stops because that's about when it seems perfectly reasonable to break into the hotel swimming pool and go skinny dipping. You know, I'll tell you, hotel security's got to be a thankless job. Okay, that's it. That's the end of Travel Commons Podcast number 74, the special fourth year anniversary edition. I hope you enjoyed this little bit of spelunking through the archives, and I hope you decide to stay subscribed. Better yet, I hope you decide to tell somebody else to subscribe. (laughs) I'll be back next time with brand new content. And always remember, the Travel Commons podcast is about travel stories uh, coming from me and coming from you. And if you have a story, a thought, a comment, a gripe, moans and groans, cries of the traveler, (laughs) send them along, text or MP3 file to comments, C-O-M-M-E-N-T-S at travelcommons.com. Or you can uh, you can hit me on Twitter, M. Peacock, just like it seems like the rest of the world now has uh, has uh, piled on Twitter. Is is that uh, is that phenomenon peaking or is it past? I don't know. I haven't figured that one out yet. Or you can always always post them on the website uh, at travelcommons.com. Thanks to everyone who has taken the time to send in emails and tweets and post comments on the website. And until we talk again, thanks for coming by the Travel Commons. Travel safe. Bye now. his hill strange bed in a lonely motel but one thing needs my mind the warm woman that I left behind from California to Carolina she calls me up and there's nothing finer and when the tears start falling 